Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be here with Commissioner Gottlieb. For those of you that don't know Scott, can I call you Scott? Yes. <laughs> Scott is a physician, a policy wonk, an investor, an industry expert, former investor, a, a cancer survivor, a husband, and a father. And now he's the 23rd Commissioner of Food and Drugs. Over the last 18 months, this is your third tour That's of right. FDA? That's right. Yep. And in your first year, you approved more new drugs, more generics. You also have had a very aggressive public health agenda that included limiting nicotine levels, regulating e-cigarettes, getting dangerous opioids off of the market. And you're responsible for the fact that if I go to a McDonald's, I know how many calories I eat with a Big Mac. And for those of you that haven't been following the news as closely, this past week, Scott was voted Time Magazine's one of 50 most influential leaders. So you are accomplished, you're influential, and people also think you're a fashionista. <laughs> so for those of you that don't follow our commissioner on Twitter, I highly suggest that you do so. And because I knew I was going to be next to him on stage today, I made sure to absolutely dress up my shoes today. So I hope that I'm beating Scott at his sock game today. So let's jump in, because I know we don't have that much time with you. Over the course of the last 24 hours, we've heard a lot about the future of health. And if there is one thing that has been a consistent theme throughout this summit, it's been that the greatest disruption and the greatest source of innovation is the idea of being patient-centered and really listening to what patients actually need. You've been on three different tours of the FDA, and over the last few years, the FDA has been an incredible leader in what it means to be patient-centered. I'd love for you to first start by reflecting on how that's changed and what it means to the FDA, and what is this really a values-oriented strategy, or how you think about that? Well, I think it certainly is a values strategy. I know Janet touched on um, some of those issues today about the changing orientation um, of the agency and the sense that uh, you know, the clinicians really are the house staff, they're medical officers working um, in medical endeavors in, in the pursuit of um, trying to improve outcomes for patients. But I think you know, we've done discrete things to try to incorporate patient, um, patient perspectives into our regulatory decision making and inform our policy making. Um, things like patient reported outcomes, building them in as, as measures and as the outcomes in clinical trials. But I think that the other big opportunity, in addition to trying to find discrete ways to um, bring patients into the dialogue, bring patient perspectives into the regulatory decision making process, is some of the tools that we, uh, we're going to have available to us to actually measure things that are meaningful to patients. And so we're going to be promulgating in a couple of weeks um, a platform for how you can incorporate digital health tools in, in the context of the approval of a drug. So you could get approval for a, a drug digital health tool um, delivery system, if you will. Um, and these are going to be digital tools that could help with patient compliance, uh, could measure um, patient symptoms, um, or maybe could measure um, outcomes, measure physical performance in a way that it could be used for uh, either post-market surveillance, post-market commitments, or future regulatory decision making, trying to collect information that can be used for supplemental indications. So right now, for example, we use um, a six-minute walk test as a standard measure of physical performance for a lot of clinical trials, particularly for neurodegenerative diseases in children, the mucopolysaccharide diseases. Um, that's not a really great measure all the time of physical performance. Someone can come to the doctor and just have a bad day. They're coming once a month or once every two weeks for a checkup and, and being measured on a, on a walk test on a treadmill. We know that you know, we have watches now that could potentially measure our physical performance on a daily basis and, and, and better um, track uh, if we're improving, if our physical performance is improving. And obviously, these need to be validated, these kinds of tools. But those are the opportunities, I think, that we're going to have. And, and our goal is to try to build up, out regulatory frameworks that enable these tools to come to market. So an example of looking at digital tools that could be used in conjunction with drugs um, what we're looking to do there is incorporate the digital tools into the product labeling in a way that they can be regulated in the post-market as part of the promotional labeling, um, as opposed to just being uh, having to be regulated as uh, pre-market uh, medical devices and undergo pre-market review. So this is going to help facilitate the development of more of these kinds of tools. So Scott, this for, for us, we had a session yesterday on um, the future of data disrupting health. And one of the aha moments was 
the transition from having what is unstructured data, or some people called it dirty data, into data that is going to be meaningful and useful. And it sounds like this is the type of innovation from a regulatory perspective that's going to become, that's going to create more understanding of how to integrate this. Is that a fair way of, of understanding the, the path that you, got, you all are on? I think it is. I think that you know, for a lot of the, if you look at a lot of the outcomes, you know, there's objective outcomes like you know, tumor shrinkage, objective outcomes in, in oncology, but a lot of the measures that we use in clinical development um, measure physical performance or measure um, how patients experience symptoms. And I think that there was ways to incorporate um, technology that, that's going to allow us to gather that information in a much more objective fashion, um, more reliably, um, perhaps more quickly, so that if you have better tools that are more sensitive for measuring change um, in, in physical symptoms or physical performance, you can potentially get an answer more quickly um, than if you have a tool that's measuring physical performance that's highly variable, so you need a larger data set, you need more patients to account for the variability statistically, you need to follow them for longer because you don't have a sensitive tool, so in order to measure um, a decline in function, you need to, you need to follow patients longer, and, and you know, unfortunately, you're, you're watching someone decline in function in right. the context of the clinical trial in order to prove something works. So I think that we're going we're gonna to have more of these opportunities. If you look at what we did in Alzheimer's, where we, where we changed the guidance to um, before, in order to have a drug approved for Alzheimer's, you had to both have an effect on cognition as well as performance. Right. Um, the notion being that you had to decline enough in cognition so that it had a, an effect on your physical performance. But the problem was, by the time your cognition declined in that setting, you were pretty advanced in the disease. By the time it declined enough to affect your physical performance, you were pretty advanced in the disease. And it mitigated against trying to develop a drug for early Alzheimer's um, before the decline in cognition had an effect on physical performance. We put out new guidance that said that you only need to now, in certain settings, hit on cognition, if you can measure changes in cognition. And one of the things that facilitated our ability to do that was the advent of better tools for measuring changes in cognition, not just right. better um, surveys that we used to sort of measure cognition, but better tools for actually collecting the data, where we now had digital platforms for doing that, so you can collect them in a more reliable fashion and have better quality control in terms of how you collecting that information. That's great. Well, one of the questions that, you know, for faster cures, we've been in a, a, we've been focused on this idea of patient engagement. We've been incredibly impressed with what the FDA has done in terms of all of its listening sessions, sessions it's held over the last few years. And now there's been a real a surge, or a surge in activity by almost every group that's out here from a patient perspective and wanting to really own the future of what is meaningful to them. When you think about your review staff and you think about the, the, the talent that you have, the FDA, and what's happened, do you see um, a meaningful difference in how they're really considering the patient? How has it really changed the culture even within the FDA? Well, I, I think the bottom line is it has changed the culture. The, the, the engagement and the, the formal structures that we put in place to try to bring patients into the process um, has changed the culture of the agency. You know, the other thing we're trying to do with, with how we're restructuring the Office of New Drugs and the review process itself is, uh, you know, medical, a medical reviewer right now at FDA um, does a lot of different things. They're not just doing clinical evaluation. They're not just trying to develop new, new guidance and, and, and be thought leaders within their fields. They're also, when the review package comes into the FDA right now, they're the ones taking the raw data and, and putting it in charts mm -hmm. and, and, and analyzing the data in statistical packages. A medical officer shouldn't be doing that. We should be having experts who are expert in data analytics doing the initial analysis. We should have people who know how to format data doing, um, doing the formatting and assembling it into standardized uh, presentations that then the medical reviewer can use. And so what we're trying to do with the reform that we're undertaking with the Office of New Drugs is actually free the medical review staff and create more cross-agency um, cross functions to do some of the technical aspects of the review process so that the clinical officers can be a clinical house staff, so that they can do focus on the clinical portion of the review, so that they have more time to engage with patients, yeah. and so that they have more time to engage as thought leaders within their fields. And so that's the key element of what we're doing with the O&D reform. I literally talk to reviewers who will explain to me that they spent a whole day trying to assemble data into a chart. And you know, we, sh we should have someone, there's a lot of people who know how to do that. Most of them are under the age of 25. We shouldn't, we shouldn't have uh, you know, a physician yeah. doing that. And so we're trying to 
create these kinds of cross-function units to do some of the uh, some of the um, the structural work, the analytical work that goes into the review. And I think that's going to also, you know, we estimated that it's going to improve productivity by about 20 percent. Um, but what we're trying to do with that improved productivity now is facilitate the development of many more disease-specific guidances. We committed to put out hundreds of new disease-specific guidances and also free our house staff to engage more with the external community. And you're starting to see that now, um, but that's the long-term vision. I remember the days when you would never be able to meet a review staff, and now you have them spending all day at meetings about what's meaningful to patients in all sorts of different ways. So I want to touch on the fact that you spent 15 years as a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, and there's a long body of writing that you've done on the role of government in creating transparency and be being a force in creating efficient markets. One of the keys to transparency is the availability of information. So as the FDA commissioner, how do you feel like you've moved forward in terms of the transparency the agency can have to be a good steward of what's happening in public health and inform the public of what's happening. I actually published 826 uh, articles, and I know that only because the Senate collected them all <laughs> for my confirmation <laughs> hearing. And the, the best part of my confirmation hearing was uh, when I, I handed them all in, I had to hand in a list of every article I ever published, and I, I inadvertently, and it was completely inadvertently, left three off, and they found them. <laughs> so, so now you have the exact number. So, what was So now that? I have them all. Um, you know, one of the things I, I talked about, um, you know, the reform of the, the new drug approval process, one of the things that we're doing right now is creating a more structured review. Um, and you're going to start to see this uh, first on, on the safety side uh, in terms of how we review safety data coming into the agency. Um, and what we're trying to do is across all the different therapeutic divisions look at data the same way. So when data comes in, we're going to have those cross-functional units uh, analyze the data in a similar fashion, assemble the data in, in charts that are um, Paper preferred, charts. no, digital charts <laughs> that are preferred to FDA. What's facilitating this is the fully electronic uh, uh, submission of data right now. Um, we're now going to make more of the bottom line data from the review process available publicly. We started that as a pilot. Companies right. have been opting into it. Um, but we're going to try to make more of the bottom line data available as part of the, um, you know, the review memo that gets uh, ultimately promulgated. But what part of what, what's what a structure review is going to enable is that at the end of the process, at the end of the review process, when the drug's approved, we're going to be able to make information about um, how, how and why we made our decision available much more quickly within probably 48 hours. And it's going to be a, more of a problem. And just for context for the audience, is like, what is it now? Is 48 the, hours exponentially faster? Yeah, yes, it's much faster. It could take weeks for, until you have that level of detail. There's some initial information for public, but in terms of the level of detail, we're going to make available is going to be much more quickly. And the review memo, so right now the review process is you have a lot of people who are consultants to the review process, each developing their own review memos. And, and it's a lot of cut and paste. If you look at different review memos as part of the standard review package, it's a lot, a lot of cut and paste. What we're going to do is have the different disciplines that are part of the review teams um, collaborating around one digital review template, much like you probably all do in in, in your corporate jobs. We don't do that right now at FDA. Uh, and we're going to have one review memo. And the review memo is going to be more of a problem-based review memo. What were the questions, what were the critical questions we needed to answer as part of making a decision? And how did we resolve those questions? And so it's going to be a much more accessible document, I think, to providers, to patients, to people on the outside who want to review our work. And this will all be in the, it's at least part of it, in the public domain eventually. This is all going to be in the public domain. And the place where we're, where uh, implementing this approach first is around the safety portion of the mm -hmm. review. So in, in your past budgets, you've put in for a knowledge management system. Is this related to knowledge management? Tell us a little bit about what that request really is about and how that plays into the notion of predictability or transparency. Right. So right now, if, you, if, if someone came to me and asked me, how many times has FDA re approved um, an oncology drug based on a, a measure of s effectiveness against this, this specific biomarker, the way I would answer that question is I'd try to assemble everyone in a room to ask them. And I'd usually start with Bob Temple, because he's been there the longest. Um, <laughs> We don't have the ability to query our own um, decisions. We don't have the ability to look across our own decisions to try to extract from them um, where, we made where we made decisions based on common elements. Uh, all, you know, all of our 
our historical precedence is embedded in people's minds. And so literally, when we're developing new guidance documents um, where we're trying to consolidate collected knowledge over time, um, those are developed by bringing together big teams of people and, and trying to query them. So what we wanted to do is develop a knowledge management system that allows us to incorporate our own precedent and query it uh, in a real-time fashion. And this is, not, this is something that a lot of knowledge enterprises have. Um, we don't have it. We don't have it anywhere in the agency right now. We have a, a Google search bar. Um, and so we want to develop this, uh, this kind of a system. And, we, and the budget request that we had in 2019 has a specific request for this and, and the request we made in 2020 as well. So how urgent of an issue is this? Are you like most federal agencies that's looking at a tsunami of retirement? Now you don't have those people in the room? Well, um, I'm, I'm less worried about, I'm worried about retirements because like a lot of federal agencies, we have a cohort of people who came aboard at a, a certain time and um, a lot of you know, our leadership is, is reaching uh, our retirement age. But I'm not worried about um, retirements from this perspective. I, I think this is something that a lot of government agencies don't have. But a lot of government agencies, I think, don't, you know, most government agencies are passed through agencies. We're, we, we pass through very few dollars. Our money is spent at FDA developing intellectual capital and evaluating information. And so we're an information enterprise. And the fact that we don't have um, the ability to catalog and easily query uh, our, own, our own decisions is, an, is a challenge, especially as those decisions bec become more complex and we want to bring regulatory consistency across yeah. how we make decisions. And ultimately, if we built this tool, this would be a publicly accessible tool. Um, you know, there's companies on the outside, database companies that make a living developing um, you know, databases that you can query around specific aspects of regulatory decision making. No one's built anything that would be a comprehensive tool on the order of what we want to develop. Well, for product sponsors as well as just patients, I would think that that's something, yeah. that predictability is something we count on. The other thing is, you know, we, we, on an ad hoc basis, we will consolidate, for example, we'll, on, on certain safety reviews, consolidate safety data sets across uh, multiple product reviews. Now, this is a very touchy issue because companies um, claim that their, their data from their packages is commercial confidential information, and if we're consolidating that into a data set to make regulatory decision making across a class, we need to be very mindful how we do that in a way that doesn't um, abrogate uh, um, you know, their intellectual property in those respects. But we do do it, and people know we've done it. We, we, we've been public about it. But when we do it, those data sets aren't available publicly. So we're, we are making decisions by putting queries against a consolidated data set that people on the outside can't query to see if we've made the right decision or to adjudicate their own decisions. Um, that's not an enviable position. No. If we're going to be developing those, that kind of intellectual um, capital and property um, and make decisions based on it, we need to make that available. So this is another thing that would, you know, if you had a knowledge management system that helped facilitate the, the consolidation of this information and make it publicly available, it's another opportunity that we'd be able to provide. That's great. Well, I want to make, for those of you that don't often listen to the FDA commissioner, and one of the most important points to make is that uh, Scott and his agency actually regulate, is it 20 cents on every dollar spent? So 20% 20, 20 of the economy is regulated in some and form it's a, by And it's a growing 20%. Mm -hmm. So tell us, I mean, there are all sorts of new areas of science. You just talked about areas that you're in, selling gene-based therapies. We've talked about when, when people say you're moving towards a risk-based approach for regulation, what does that mean? And how are you thinking about how the regulatory um, frameworks keep up with the speed of the science? Well, I think we've always, we've always talked about trying to have a risk-based approach to regulation. And I think when, we think when we think about that, that means trying to apply our regulatory tools in the areas of highest risk. And the most palpable place you know, to get a sense of what it means to be a risk-based system is in, in the post-market setting when you're doing foreign inspections or inspections of manufacturing facilities. Um, you know, we, we inspect on, on the basis of risk, and we have models to identify facilities that we think represent more risk based on where they're located, past history, the kinds of products they're manufacturing, what we found on past inspections, what we know about the, the proprietors of those facilities. And we will go into certain facilities more often than other facilities. Some facilities we won't inspect on a regular schedule, others we will. And so that's a risk-based model. Um, you know, if you look at um, the Department of Agriculture, and this isn't to cast aspersions on my colleagues at the USDA, but the way they, the way they uh, inspect meat and poultry is they have an inspector in every plant. 
Um, we don't put an inspector physically in every plant. We go into facilities based on risk models, and, we, and when we inspect those facilities, we're looking at things based on um, knowledge about where the points are that could create risk to consumers. And that's, that's the essence of what it means to be a risk-based model. Um, I think as, as we sort of um, you know, advance those, those approaches, the opportunities come from having more information to better target uh, how we do what we do. So tell us how that philosophy has, has, has permeated even in things like your digital health strategy or things like cell and gene-based therapies. Yeah, so like in, 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 with respect to digital health, look, we, we are, I think one of the things that, that marks this time in science and, 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 and the regulatory challenges we face is that we are facing the advent of entirely new areas of technology and innovation where the old regulatory models don't apply real well. Um, when it comes to gene therapy, when it comes to regenerative medicine, when it comes to digital health tools, um, laboratory tests, if we tried to retrofit the existing regulatory paradigm onto these new areas, um, we would stifle innovation. And in some cases, it's going to require us to seek new legislative authority. You saw us provide uh, about 70 pages of technical assistance to <laughs> Congress around what we, what we think would be an optimal approach to the regulation of laboratory-developed tests and diagnostics. In digital health, I think that that's a very palpable example where we had to come up with a new regulatory paradigm for how we would approach that. So digital health tools are highly iterative. They change, you know, you're trying to make constant changes to them, um, to iterate them, to improve those tools. You think about a, an app on your phone or on your smartwatch. Um, if we required companies to come in and file a 510k supplement every time they wanted to uh, push, push out an update on a medical app, um, you know, it, it just wouldn't happen. Uh, and so we, we've taken what we're calling a firm-based approach to the regulation of, of lower-risk digital health tools, where tools that meet the definition of being a medical device and are subject to FDA's regulation, rather than regulating each specific product, what we're going to do is validate the underlying um, architecture of the software and allow firms that meet certain requirements in terms of their own SOPs to come to market with new products and new iterations of their existing products without requiring pre-market clearance each time. They'll be subject to, to post-market evaluation. But when you, you know, when you look at um, the level of validation that some of these companies are engaging in, and I don't want to be company specific, but I've seen what some of these companies do. They ha they, they're undertaking an enormous amount of validation. If we can go in, inspect them, um, see their SOPs, understand the level of validation that they're, that they're requiring before they put their, mar their products in the market, and, and it's an otherwise low-risk product, we can allow them to go to market uh, and just be subject to post-market um, you know, exercise of, uh, of regulation. This is, you know, if you look at the Consumer Product Safety Commission, this is how they regulate. They put out standards, people manufacture products subject to the standards when a product problem is identified in the marketplace, um, they issue a recall, they could take other remedies. There's very few things in, in commerce that are subject to pre-market approval, where you need pre-market approval before you can go to market with the product. Medical products are one, um, pesticides, aircraft engines, it's not a long list of things where you need the government's permission to be able to go to market. Um, and so putting the app on my watch on that list, we need to decide whether that meets the level of risk where we need to, to require that level of oversight. And the answer has been uh, more recently, no. We don't, we don't need to apply that level of oversight, even if it's meeting the definition of being a medical device. We could think differently about how we apply regulation. Right. So I want to switch to the fact that FDA is now on track to, to approve more products than you did last year, which was a record year, where you had approved 46 products. And about 40% of products, it's almost holding steady year over year, have been really for orphan designations, orphan drugs. Uh, yesterday, we had Harvard econ economist Amitabh Chandra come to us and talk to us a little bit about his research. And one of the data points he gave us was that the public health needs and where R&D pipelines are are not a match. Just as an example of that, in mental health, the burden of disease is 15%, whereas the R&D pipeline is less than 2%. Knowing that FDA isn't the only actor and what's needed for either pull or push incentives, what do you think is the role of the FDA to re-energize the innovation that needs to happen in these large, big public health disease classes? Well, on, on, the, on the issue of the statistics, we're, we're, last year was a record year for the number of novel medical devices we approved, novel drugs and, and generic drugs. We'll probably break all three records this year. I, I, we just approved the first new antiviral drug for flu in 20 years, and I think that might have now, we might have now surpassed 
the record number of approvals of, of all time, and it's, it's only October, so we'll see how we do <laughs> between now uh, and, and at the end of the year. I, I have multiple concerns in this realm. I have a concern that it's become too hard to innovate uh, in areas where there's good, so-called good enough generics in some of the primary care areas. And I think that we, there has been such a focus on significant unmet medical needs that we've lost sight of the palpable public health improvement that comes from something that provides incremental um, increments of additional efficacy for something that's an otherwise ordinary condition. I mean, if you could, you know, shave 10 hours off of the common cold, mm -hmm. when you aggregate 10 hours of relief from the common cold over a population of tens of millions of people who are going to get a cold each year, the overall um, public health impact of that could be enormous. Uh, and so I think, and, and productivity improvements and things like that, um, you know, so I think that we, we've, we've lost sight of the public health gains that come with small increments of, of improvement on, in therapeutics that treat otherwise common conditions that aren't necessarily life-threatening, but where the symptoms do, um, do impact people's lives. And, you know, it's become hard to run clinical trials in those settings because the, the expectation of safety has grown over time. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. I always say that if you gave me the choice between driving um, a 2002 Honda Accord with 200,000 miles on it or a 1980 Corvette that's been on cinder blocks <laughs> and never driven, has zero miles on it, I would take the 2002 Honda Accord because it's a safer car. It has airbags, it has you know, anti-lock brakes, um, it has dual suspension, I can go on and I'll, right. I'll probably get into things, don't I, don't, I, things I don't understand. <laughs> um, but, so you know, the expectation for safety has grown over time and the regulatory process has, has built in um, you know, more oversight to meet those expectations. And I think that that's appropriate. As technology gets better, we should be using it um, to improve what our expectations are about both the benefits and the risks of the products we take. But that can't come at the expense of creating inordinate hurdles. And I think in some therapeutic areas, the hurdles are very high right now. The, the clinical trial, trial requirements are very big. And that's where you have to look at, I think, the, the kinds of tools that can make it easier to collect information in a fashion um, that is just as rigorous, um, but perhaps less onerous. Mm -hmm. Things like collecting information um, through real world, um, you know, uh, performance of, of people uh, every day, measuring, measuring um, you know, real world performance of, to measure lung function, to measure right. physical performance, things, things like that. Um, I'm also worried about on the reimbursement side at the, yeah. at the other end of that barbell, when you're looking at the drugs targeted to rare diseases, I think we have a highly nimble, highly innovative um, paradigm for drug development, medical product development, and an ossified yeah. um, paradigm for reimbursement. And there are places where I'm extremely worried that if we don't adapt the approach to reimbursement soon, we may foreclose therapeutic opportunities. I was around, and you were around too, when we didn't get the reimbursement for the radio pharmaceuticals right. Nope. And, and there were some good drugs at the time that worked, um, and they're not used anymore, and we destroyed, not fully destroyed, but we, we really shrunk the opportunity for radio pharmaceutical development in this country by underpaying the hospitals and forcing them to lose money on the application of, of radio pharmaceuticals. Well, we're doing the same thing with CAR-T right now, and I think we have a window of opportunity to think about how we're gonna reimburse that appropriately. There's things FDA can potentially do in terms of how, the, how we label the products, um, but we're going to need to think about what, what an appropriate uh, reimbursement approach is to some of these novel therapeutic areas if we want to see these sustained. Many people have observed that you're one of the few commissioners that has been very vocal about payment issues, drug pricing. Do you, is the, do you feel like that is something that is critical now that you, you're advancing science you're on the forefront of knowing what's in pipelines, but the payer community by and large doesn't have the same point of view or the capacity to really be that in deep on every scientific advancement. What is the FDA's role in bridging between the payers? Well, I, I think I've stuck to my knitting. I think that when you look at the um, issues of drug pricing, there is product competition and there's price competition. And when it comes to price competition, you think about um, you know, the reimbursement constructs that are exercised by Medicare or the, how, how, how PBMs and health plans are organized. When you think about product competition, you think about uh, making sure there's timely generic entry when exclusivities and patents have lapsed on branded drugs and making sure there's second and third to market innovation in some of these novel, um, novel indications. And so we've been focused on trying to bring more product competition to the market with the hope that if there's more products available within categories, 
the payment system is either going to use that to create price competition or hopefully adapt to figure out how to use that to create price competition in places where there's a lack of price competition based on product variety, like in Medicare Part B, for example. Um, you know, and that's what we've been focused. I think one of the places you're going to see us focusing more going forward, aside from high value generic opportunities, is second and third to market innovation in some of these highly novel classes. We now have data that we will put out soon that shows that the time in which it takes to get second to market innovation in some of these unmet medical needs, these novel orphan categories, um, and third to market innovation uh, is taking much, much longer. And in many cases, we're seeing uh, product categories re remain monopolies in perpetuity. And I think that there is a sense in the product development community, and I've been on the other side of this, on the venture side, although I'm a little dated right now, having been out of it for a few years. But I think there is a sense that if you're going to be, if you think you'll be third to market, you pull out. Right. And so we're seeing less competition in these categories. And so to the extent that innovators are having monopolies for longer periods of time or in perpetuity, that's not just uh, creating an environment where prices stay higher or longer, but it's also foreclosing the opportunity for therapeutic variety within these categories. And we know that therapeutic variety is important from a clinical standpoint. Patients sometimes have a differential response to drugs, even if they're largely similar molecules. Great. Thank you. So I know we're almost out of time. I'm going to give you last question. Everybody who's been on the stage has been able to talk about what the future of health is. So for you, what do you think is the most exciting thing that we have to look forward to in terms of health? Well, I'll tell you the thing that I'm focused on right now the most is what we're doing on tobacco, quite frankly. Um, you know, I think that we have, uh, and I know it's not, not necessarily the answer that ties to some of, uh, some of these technology issues, but I think that we have an opportunity. When I came into FDA, we saw that smoking rates were declining in this country. I think if we get our policies right um, over a short period of time, we have the chance to dramatically um, accelerate the decline in smoking in this country. And that's going to have a more palpable public health impact than perhaps any single product introduction that I can contemplate in any reasonable period of time. Now, it's going to require us, <laughs> it's going to require us, thank you, to more rapidly migrate adults off of combustible tobacco products onto products that have reduced risk, and we have to embrace the concept of modified risk nicotine delivery products, including e-cigarettes. And it's also going to require us to make sure that those e-cigarettes, if we make them available for currently addicted adult smokers, don't become tools for addicting a generation of youth on nicotine. That's what we're seeing right now. Got a lot of fans. Uh, and we will, we will have much more to say about this in about four weeks. Thank you for spending your day with us, Scott. I know it's been a busy day. And please join me in thanking the commissioner. Thanks a lot. <laughs>